Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show. This is episode number 207-207-207. Eso mio, Agostino Zynga. What's up? Buenos dias. How you doing? How you feeling? Mother effers. Hope you're doing well. You're well hydrated, well wasted, and well whatever. I don't know why I did that. Well, 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 end of my sentence. But hey-ho, what can you do? It is, what, Sunday during the week. I'm not sure what day it is. My mind is already spinning. But whatever day in the week it is, I hope you guys are well hydrated, rested, limbered, and you just feel good this midweek. Or, oh, it's Tuesday, isn't it? Fucking Tuesday. Yeah, it's Tuesday. Not Wednesday. It's Tuesday. It feels like a Wednesday. It's a Tuesday. The week has been dragging along. Um, I think um, the post festival blues have still lingering in the back of my mind. You know, Junction Two is still fresh in my mind. I'm still here thinking about all the things I heard, all the people I saw, the textures, the sounds, the place, the whatever it may be, and I'm bemoaning everything about it. You know what makes? I was just thinking the other day. You know what makes a really good festival? Sometimes just the preparation alone is really good, right? When we went to Primavera for the first time. I think just the prep alone, right? Getting the flight sorted, the confusion about the Airbnbs, where we're going to go, hotel, this, that, last minute changes. All that excitement was awesome, right? But sometimes you have these rare occasions where you're so excited just going, it's enough that sometimes you get to the event and it's even more exciting. Sometimes it doesn't happen that way, right? Sometimes it's like, it's a bit of a let down the actual event and the actual prep was nicer. The actual prep was more fun. It's sort of similar to like maybe pursuing a partner, pursuing somebody sexually. You might be like, oh, you might be so on it, so on their case uh, before the actual deed gets done. And once the deed is done, you're like, oh, you feel a bit flat. But in some rare occasions, especially when it's to do with places that you go to, on some rare occasions, you're like, wow, this build up was fun. And the actual event was even more fun. Was it, it just past your expectations? And I think Jackson Two really did that for me personally. Again, I think maybe the bar was set quite low in terms of London events because, like I said, I've been to Love Box. Um, what else I've been to? I've been to what's the other one? I've been to a couple others. I went to the one in the South London. I've got the one that was called. But I've been to a couple other London festivals, and in general, they've been really underwhelming. Right, so much so you're like bloody hell. Thank God I've only come here to see one guy play. Right, because the time I went to go see Harvey play Love Box. I was okay with paying 70 quid for a day ticket because I assumed, you know, I'm going to see Harvey play and then everyone else is kind of a bonus. Um, I'm, if I would see Harvey play in a bar, I'd have to pay already 70 quid after you put a drink. Of course, I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm just paying 70 just for the ticket. So, you know, it doesn't really equate the same way, but it's a summer day. It was in Victoria Park. I had some money left over. I didn't see it as that much of a big deal. But even when I left out, I was like, bloody hell, man. Imagine paying for this. Imagine looking up. Imagine looking forward to that festival for the whole year, right? If you're a kid. Because nowadays, I'd imagine kids don't go to nightclubs, right? I don't see any kids usually in nightclubs unless they're going specifically to go see a DJ, like a bicep or something. You don't see many young kids in nightclubs. But if they are going to a nightclub, right, they're really billing it. Usually the night they're going to has been curated specifically to their taste. So they've got promoters who know what they're doing. They know how to appeal to kids who only want to see a person that's been featured on DJ Mag, Mixed Bang or Resident Advisor. It's not a slight. It's just, you know, there's some promoters that don't know how to do that job really well. They book those mainline headline DJs like More Grabs and Dax J's and Emily Lenz and all these people that are hyped and Peggy Goo and... I don't know, name after name, and then they fill up, fill up the lineup with people who kind of, you know, will complement those names, So who are also quite big in the young scene, like Eclair Fifi and a few other people, uh, Jasper James, you know, the same kind of names that kind of you kind of see around and around and around. So those are, those are really good ones to go to if you're a kid, right? Because, you know, by and large, um, the only thing that's going to let you down is the venue, right? Maybe overzealous uh, bouncers, maybe shitty sound, poor organization, but for the most part, the lineup is sorted. Festivals are a proper flipping, proper flip of a coin, right? Because you don't know, you have no idea. There's so many things that could go um, left that you have no experience, they have no um, control over. The festival could organize it, and they could get a limiter removed from it. It could be all all lights are green. Then suddenly, a couple of days before, the council changes their mind, and the festival doesn't want to inform the customers because they're afraid people won't turn up, and they just go carry on with it, thinking they can get away with with the sound that they've got and all of a sudden you're going to a festival that's super sparse not a lot of people are going there imagine if it's raining as well it might be usually Londoners are a bit more we're a bit more hardened in that respect because you know it rains all the time here so we don't usually care about the rain if it's a festival season you only have to look at Glastonbury to see how packed it is when it's raining it's even more packed right all the fucking OGs come out because it kind of washes away all the fraff so we don't really care about the rain but sometimes some festivals get affected by rain they get affected by being in the wrong 
time schedule is packed with other, other festivals happening at the same time. Luckily, Field Junction didn't have that because, you know, Field Day was not really the same kind of crowd, I'd say, that would go to Junction. There might be some overlap with some artists, but for the most part, people that went to go see DJs played will go and see, go to Junction. People that went to see artists will go and see Field Day. So there's loads of things that could go out of your control. So festivals have probably now become probably the most important thing because I'm just re I was just looking over some pictures again yesterday on um, Instagram looking through the tag and looking through the location thing whatever and it seemed like a lot of I didn't really notice it while I was there because I was out of my head but it seemed there's a lot of people under 24 that went there and it's and it makes sense now you know in terms of value for money there's nothing better than going to a festival really you don't you know you save loads of money during the year because you don't go out every Friday night all right and if you are going out you're going back to local weather spoons or something or a local bar or a local kind of you know um what what do they call them a bistro bar or something that serves a bistro pub that serves like good food and has good drinks you might go to an actual bar bar that does like good cocktails and whatever it may be called liquors and stuff so you're saving quite a bit of money because you're not paying 20 30 pounds just to get in then you're spending another 30 50 quid 30, 50 to 100 quid on your drinks you're really saving your peas so when someone comes around and you know people want to go to outlook or they want to go to deck mantle or they want to go to how to or they want to go to junction you're more than happy to spend 250 you know, just to get there, right? Or have a tickets and all that sort of malarkey and maybe accommodation and you just go home after that, right? It's all, it's all well and good. So yeah, I'm a big fan of those things. And again, just got the, you know, just like, oh man, I wish I was staying there longer. But I'm happy anyway, because if I would have gone Saturday, I would have been super bummed. Like it would have been even worse. At least it's a Friday and I got to kind of recover on a Saturday and I'm remembering, reminiscing on a Sunday. Uh, but if I went, if I would have went birthdays, I would have been abs- crying into the palms of my hands about that didn't happen so i'm in a good place right now i'm trying to tell myself that <laughs> i remember this track actually that got played on the friday i don't know who played this this might have been who played this who was before dixon i don't remember who that was but this is before somebody someone played this that i shazammed let me see if i can get it up on here way back by brenda russell it might have been mr g right mr g at um the selector stage in the, on the main stage, sorry, right? Selector series. And he might have been the one. What is it called? Brenda G Way Back. Let's see what this sounds like. Probably going to get me kicked off YouTube, but you know, Brenda G Way Back. Where is that what it's called? Brenda Russell. Let's see what this sounds like. I'll type on my phone. Way Back When. Let's see what this sounds like. But this is why I heard, I think, from Mr. G, right? Get up when I take off my headphones. Yeah, this is definitely yeah, it. Was awesome. Awesome. So let me stop it there just in case I get taken up. But that I heard. That was fucking cool. And I pulled up a little bit. Yeah, I'm definitely going to play that when I get back DJing. But yeah, anyways, apart from that, let's move on because I don't want to get myself um, emotional and stuff. I've been reading this book. Number one. Yeah, can you see it on the screen? It's called Selfie How the West Became Self Obsessed by William Store or Will Store, sorry. An amazing book. I'm not sure where I stumbled upon it because I, I saved so many books on my Amazon wish list. I should really make notes on where I heard it and where I got it, heard it mentioned. But, you know, you listen. I had so many podcasts. It's my main kind of form of entertainment. I ended up kind of saving stuff and kind of adding it later. I'm going to buy it end of the month when I get paid and stuff. But in general, this book, again, is quite soft, um, self-descriptive. It kind of uh, tracks the... The cult of individualism, really, in the West and kind of compares it to the Far East and other countries and stuff and other regions around the world and sort of gives us a remedy as to how we can um, fight against it. And it's a very cool book and there's a passage here that I want to read out quickly uh, before we get into our topics here. Da, 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 what bit was it? Was it this one or is this one here? So this is there's a section in the book where um, the author goes to a monastery, right, to kind of, um, he's really trying to examine uh, individualism in the West and trying to examine people who live selfishly and people who live selflessly, right? And he goes to a monastery and he meets a dude in there who's decided whether or not he wants to become a monk. And this is the following chapter in the book. So he says here, um, here we go. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So um, after, after Lords um, at 4.30 in the morning, I became distracted by a quiet path that led through the wooden grave markers. Curious, I followed it. Behind an old stone wall, I came across a Londoner called Robert. Pale in his mid-forties with fitting curly hair, small round glasses and a blue raincoat, he told me he was staying at Plus Carden because he was considering becoming a monk. It's scary, he said. But when you think of it, is it just the devil trying to put me off? If you have faith, you shouldn't really be scared of anything. Why is it scary? The author asked. His voice dropped. 
There's no getting away from it. He said, you come here to die. Die? Well, it's like the old self gets killed off and they replace it with the Holy Spirit. I was thinking about that, I said. There's probably not a lot of opportunity to sin like in a place like this. You're going to become a better person almost by default. The look, of, uh, the look on his face told me I wasn't getting it. Living for yourself is living within sin, he said. What they're trying to do is the opus dia, the work of God. But aren't you worried that doing it every day will get a bit boring? He looked at me exasperated. But that's the whole point. And it's funny, this section, because I'm also reading another book uh, called uh, Digital, Minimalism, Digital Minimalism, right, by this guy called um, Cal Newport. I've got two books on the go. This I'm, li this I'm listening to via audio book is here. As you can see on the screen a little bit there. Can you see that? Ba, ba, ba. It's called Digital Minimalism. Anyway, Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. Really a great book as well. And he kind of, uh, again, he's a, a minimalist, a digital minimalist. He's pushing this, this uh, movement where you basically the book kind of uh, lays out the premise that we're way way too distracted nowadays with our smartphones and social media and laptops and stuff and that we haven't um cultivated any time to reflect or to be with our own thoughts um of course meditation has been a big thing in startup world and silicon valley world but the first you know first thing you need to do before that is to really be comfortable uh being by yourself and being bored in some way shape or form as a section in the book that they have right any kind of um the remedy to this is that towards the end of the book there's a a program a set methodology you no know, a test where you basically go through 30 days of no digital devices at all to kind of reset your you know kind of overall awareness and then after that you try and reevaluate which things are crucial and which what which things are convenient which things are critical in your life technology wise we should just bit by bit so it might be that you delete all your social media accounts from your phone, but you only use them on a particular day during the week. So if you're an artist and you need to upload stuff on Instagram, you might say to yourself, I'll upload stuff once a week. So Monday, or let's say three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Sunday. So on Mondays, you redownload the app, you upload what you need to upload, you delete it, and then you carry on. Wednesday, do the same thing. Sunday, do the same thing. Um, so it's a way to kind of uh, allow some kind of temperance. Because I know most of us as well, I know I have in the past struggled with looking at my phone. At the moment, I've done pretty well a ton of notifications on my phone for the most part apart from gmail um if i'm applying for jobs and stuff i like to like know when that stuff is coming in um but other, other than that i don't have any notifications open i have to go to individual apps to kind of use them i delete my instagram by accident actually so now i don't have that anymore to use um i don't really use facebook that often only to really put my events up i don't browse on it i have an ad, i have a blocker that blocks my feed so i don't get to see what people are doing so i don't really know what anyone's doing around on my Facebook, so I basically just use it as a form to just kind of put my events up. So loads of things I've done, but they're still not kind of fully in. I'm not. I'm kind of one foot in, one foot out. So this book, um, Digital Minimalism, plus this book, The Selfie, had really got me ref reflecting a bit um, on kind of where I stand in terms of how selfish I can be in terms of all those things. And I guess in general, the main theme I was talking about was a bit where he said um, being bored in in a monastery is the main point of being a monk, right? is to get comfortable being bored. That's what you want in your life. You want as least things as possible to do outside of praying, right? Because that's what you devoted your life to. You devoted your life to giving. You devoted your life to, to serving God. And this could be for anything in life, right? And I guess sometimes in my life, I think sometimes I'm, I'm maybe self-serving. A lot of things I'm doing, especially the, um, the, my, my, um, how would I say? My need to always be busy, right? The fact that I, I'm always needs to fill my time with things, the fact that I cut out certain people and I cut out hanging out just so I can focus on doing the thing that I want to do in the time that I have. I'm very precious about my time outside of work. I think I'm very collaborative, very forgiving, very open to be like, you know, to give my time to work and allow them to do, you know, allow to help people to help out, stay behind longer. Obviously, most of it has to do with the fact that you're getting paid, right? So there is a, an added kind of incentive there, uh, which kind of hurt, scares me a little bit too because it means there is a bit of a slave mentality going on there, right? I've got some golden handcuffs where you know you got the you got the you got the comfortability, you got the relaxation, the ease of mind, knowing that you're going to get paid on a certain day of the month every month. So then you're more susceptible to someone to telling you to stay an extra hour after work, which again isn't good because it blurs the lines between what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing, and how long you should be at work and how long you shouldn't be at work. It gets a bit muddy that way, but that I'm, I'm more I'm more uh, forgiving too. But when it comes to my outside life, like there is no compromise really. If I don't have the time, if I have to do something I have to do, I don't make sacrifices at all. I just stay on what I need to do. And sometimes it can be detrimental to friendships, relationships, whatever. It can, you know, it can cause some issues. But that's that's the way I've been for a while. And then on top of that, 
I try and always add things into my time to make sure I'm not wasting time, quote unquote, right, in my head. Um, but that's just an excuse for me not to be bored. I don't like to be bored, so I fill myself up with loads of things like DJing, reading books, running un- ungodly amount of miles a week and stuff. It's all kind of a way to kind of... Uh, it feels like it's just a way to keep my mind occupied and keep myself occupied, which again, isn't necessarily the best of things because it's not coming from a real place. It's coming from a place just having more distractions. You're not necessarily living in the moment. You're not necessarily living in activity, actually enjoying it for what it is, experiencing it for what it's meant to be. There are little things I've done in my life to kind of combat that. If I'm ever waiting for a friend at a bus stop or like at a train station or a bar, I try. I don't use my phone. I try not to use my phone. I don't use my phone for the most part. I just try to like sit in a moment and experience everything around me. People watch, watch my breathing, uh, make sure my posture is good. Little thing, I just I just try and be in the moment. I try and, as much as I can because you know, I'm always on my phone, I'm always on my, my laptop, I'm always kind of digitally kind of motivated. So I like, use those times to kind of pause. When I'm reading, I don't do anything else but read a book, right? I don't try and, I don't try and, uh, I don't know, multitask or answer an email. If I'm reading a book for an hour, I'd get the hour done. I don't think there's anything in my life that's been super urgent where I've had to drop everything and answer it straight away. I think that's a bit of a false narrative that they sell you, especially in startup world, especially just in office work in general, right? You have to reply back right now. Nothing's ever really that serious. And if it is, they'll let you know it's serious, right? You'll get a phone call. You'll get a, a, an email sent through with a, with a subject line in all caps and stuff. You'll get colored writing. They'll let you know when it's really urgent. But for the most part, things can get answered at when you need when you're able to answer them uh again i don't we don't advise ignoring people but you know again it doesn't need like an instant kind of like one minute reply so yeah it's got me reflecting on all these kind of things i guess in general i only mentioned this to say this is what this is the power of books i think i don't think any i don't think no medium article which again this book could probably be summarized in a pretty good medium article i'm pretty sure there's someone out there that's probably said the same sort of things as this william will Stoss said in selfie but i honestly think like books like this do a good job at really kind of uh, illuminating you know, asking you questions. Like I've only got a, foot, a quarter of the way through. And the reason why is because I've been pausing every couple of minutes, reflecting on what I just read, thinking about my life, thinking about how it applies to my life, how I can apply it to my life. It's been a really interesting book to read and very eye-opening. So I really recommend you check it out. Um, again, uh, Selfie by Will Starr, available now on all bookstores and all that malarkey. And the other one is um, Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. Both of those are available uh, on audiobook format, I think, too, as well. So, yeah, check those out. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Let's get into some topics here because time is running already. Number one topic, I saw this just the other, just this morning, actually, on the Techno subreddit. I know I speak about this subreddit all the time, but please forgive me because it's one of the best subreddits out there. Techno subreddit on, te- on Reddit, check it out. Um, somebody actually made a good uh, analysis that I wasn't aware of, but supposedly it's been six months since a resident advisor closed their comment section. And if you know anything about me and you've seen videos I've spoken about, I was really upset when they did so. Um, again, RA comment section for me has been my kind of like um, education into electronic music. That was where I kind of, again, some people have argued against it to me on the comments, especially, but um, I don't know about you, but when I first got involved into electronic music, Everest Advisor was my first place, was sort of my home base, and it has been for the most part. I think when you get involved in a scene, usually the first couple of websites you check out, the first magazines, the first couple of bands, usually stick with them, right? Like Block Party. That was maybe the first band I kind of got into indie wise because, you know, they had a black frontman, right? Simple as that. I was like, wow, I didn't know anyone else. I didn't know there was a any other black dudes that listen to this kind of music, right? It's like Lightspeed Champion, um, also known as uh, Black Orange. I'm a big fan of his because he was basically one of the only black guys I saw on TV that was doing that. Um, it's like um, loads of other ones. Um, maybe there's loads of other ones. Anyway, the first experience is always ones that you kind of hold dear. So when I first kind of stumbled into electronic music, the first thing I kind of saw was Resident Advisor. They were my first experience into it. And of course, the website is, you know, pretty well done. They have an amazing magazine with great features and great articles written by some really talented writers and on their team, some of them freelancers. They have listing of events of some of the best events out, especially on major cities. You can search via the country, via the city you're in and we can find the best events. And because it's an industry standard, most of most of, if not all, the events that you need to know about are going to be a resident advisor. There was a time when some of them were on Facebook where people were like hiding their events, or whatever. But for the most part, if if you're able to go and it's open to the public, you'll find out through R- RA regardless. They'll put it up on there, even if it's open to the public, and have like an email you can send in your RSVP list. 
Uh, they have a list of all the great festivals for you to check out too. Um, photos of club events, uh, music from artists and stuff to check out as well. The DJ charts, which I used to check a lot when I was first getting into DJing, but then you know, as soon as you get, as soon as you get a bit of practice under your belt and you start to develop your own voice in DJing or your, your own sound, the last thing you want to do is go by go via what other DJs are playing in their charts. You might you might shazam something in the nightclub when you're de- when you're out dancing. That might oh shit, I, I would have played. Yes, yeah, that's what I do. If I'm out in a rave and I hear a DJ that I like, I might shazam a song because it fits into what I want to play. Like, oh wow, I need this in my collection. But I'm not shazamming his whole set because I want to play what they want to play. It's not, there's, you know, there's no real point in that sort of thing. Uh, of course, the mixes and the podcasts are really entertaining too for a lot of people. And just in general, just a great website. But unfortunately, they took away the comment section, right, six months ago. And I think it had a lot to do with Mama Shake. Um, she was an, she's an artist, uh, a well-known DJ, actually. She had a really good uh, deck mantle set that I checked out quite recently. Actually, I'm, I'm not, I didn't really hear, I, I hadn't really heard of her prior to deck mantle set. Then obviously, I heard about her a lot since uh, she kind of came on to Resident Advisor, the mix series. But I remember Mama Shake did this um, interview on Resident Advisor, right? that was really weird and i think that was kind of the beginning and the end to the whole like comment section i think by then it already kind of went a bit awry and got a bit crazy and people were saying some wild shit on there anyway in general um but i think in general when this interview dropped is when the comment section kind of got obliterated and the people from ra were probably shook or they kind of got some pressure from the labels or managers or just in general as a team they probably thought you know what this isn't this is getting a bit uncontrollable um the only issue i have with it is that ra do have a, quite a good uh comment moderation um way of dealing with kind of spam or troll comments which i'm not really at the to say everything is troll because sometimes people just feel the way they feel if it's not what you feel if you, if, if you don't it's kind of similar to the Carlos Mazarin, ben, Stephen Crowder situation at the moment. Just because someone doesn't agree with what you say and they kind of mock you for it, doesn't mean they're a troll. They just might just because internet language is quite trolling in a sense anyway. That's what gets the attention, right? That's what people click on. That's what gives people lows. Um, if you look at some web meme pages on the internet that have those comment creep things and they kind of collate funny replies back and forth, some of the most cutty, snarky things that work best on Twitter work best on Instagram comments are what get featured, right? It's kind of the nature of the language of the internet. It might develop and evolve over time, but in general, it is the way it is, right? So, but they had a really good way of dealing with it because they kind of copied the Reddit kind of upvote and downvote section, right? Where if your comment is necessarily not really received well by the community, they'll just downvote it into oblivion so you can't see it. So sometimes it gets downvoted to a point where the comment gets deleted. Sometimes it gets downvoted to a point where it's hidden. You have to click it to kind of check it out yourself. So you have, and again, it's up to you as a as an adult to kind of decide, do you want to click it and see this, you know, probably derogatory, mostly negative comment about yourself or about an artist you manage or about someone you're a fan of, or do you want to keep it moving? But I think this kind of um, interview with Mama Shake really kind of set the cat amongst the pigeons. Um, again, I think it was mostly her fault. Mama Snake, sorry, Mama Shake. I was going to Mama Shake. Mama Snake. Um, and her RA podcast, RA number 655. This really set the cat amongst the pigeons because, again, I think it was really her fault. She came into the interview with a real agenda. I'm not sure if she woke up on the wrong side of the bed or she just had a, a bad experience just after she recorded the mix, but she just went into full SJW mode and kind of ruined the base, the the enjoyment of this mix in general. And she's a good, she's a great DJ, really talented. But again, just his whole agenda-driven thing kind of really put a bad sour taste in the mouth. Um, again, you can check out the interview yourself. I don't need to go through it, but again, just read it yourself and you can see what I mean. And I think some of the comments that are still left there kind of illustrate a lot to it. Now, um, some of the most upvoted ones, I don't think, I think they took away the votes, whatever, that on there. But again, just to, you can check out yourself. But this comment, this friend on, the second subreddit said it's been six months since it closed and the question was the following and i think it's um uh, and the, the person writes and i think it's been a shame i just don't uh i just don't eat their message um that the comment section was spawned with this for comments obviously there are some reasons involved the comment section brought much insight about clubs past and events and new releases so enough complaining and fast forward to my question does anyone know if the ra community moved on to other online places with the event added and the lively comment section facebook for example has a lot of events but never managed to produce a substance comment section which is very true right you only have to go on you know if you go if you go on a big event on an r the problem was right if you go to a big event on facebook like let's say for instance an event at print works most of the comments i know are just going to be about people selling tickets 
I've got two tickets. I've got four tickets. I've got two tickets. Like, it's just insane the amount of tickets people resell for electronic events. It's just like fucking nutty, right? So, okay, so maybe there's a... And the resale market and electronic tickets events, there's not even that high. How much money are you going to get? I don't understand people do it anyway, regardless. But... So the comment section is a bit null and void in that res- in that respect, unless sometimes the event host kind of only locks the comments only they can reply, they can only post stuff, and then in the replies of their posts just be loads of things about ticket requests and shit. So it feels like some people have migrated across to like YouTube channels, like Circle, like Circal, Circal. I don't know if you pronounce it Circle. I don't. Know, is it French? Uh, the French channel that does those amazing uh, live DJ sets in some really picturesque um, locations all around Europe. They do some great stuff. Obviously, Boiler Room, there's obviously Mix Mag, um, there's BRTV, there's a few other Italian ones that do some stuff as well. Then, of course, there's Facebook. But again, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure about you, but I've never read a Facebook comment in my life. I don't really go through them. They're, they're, you know, there's a cesspool of degenerates for the most part. That's probably the worst place to go comment. And I do remember when RA closed their comment section, they did something along the lines, they did something along the lines of, look, they're going to close their comment section, but the comments on the other page are still open, so you still continue your conversation. It's like, but no, those, those are the worst places to continue your conversations. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Like, people don't talk like this. That's not where your actual core fan base is going to be. The diehards are going to be on your websites. Most fly-by-night fans are the ones who just want to get a rye or get a rise out of certain DJs. They're going to they're gonna be the ones that are spamming your Instagram and your Twitter and your Facebooks. All the hardcore fans are going to be on your in, on your website so you're gonna have to pop up with a couple of degenerates here and there but for the most part i think it worked out really well and then um a thing that i kind of thought which really hurt my experience of resident advisor was that when i first got into electronic music again um i think the london scene because i just i i'd, I'd come from the kind of hipster dawson scene right so where i was going out to all those kind of cool bars like the alibi birthdays and whatever other bars are out there during that kind of time kind of circulating around that kind of strip once you make that jump there's not many people that you kind of take from that scene to the electronic scene right that's when i used to go to the i forgot the car park um near shoreditch where they should do loads of events there um you don't really take many people from that scene to that scene right they usually just stay there most of my friends that were from that scene in the hipster crew are still there right they're still djing in small bars in and around dawson hackney wick hackney downs they're still going into the same kind of festivals that in the same kind of vein they'd rather go to like a um what's that called what's that one called boundary something what's it called that one i saw recently they'd rather go to like a what's that first of all they'd rather go to a what's that boundary one called Is it boundary something Anyway, they won't go to like the obvious festivals that we go to in electronic music events, but they'll go to the ones that kind of are a bit more focused into the kind of things that they're into. So I had to cultivate a whole new group of people that I, I would hang around with and go out with for nights out, which again was very difficult to do. And I so the easiest thing for me to do was to go in Resident Advisor comment section and check out the events that people were really hyping up and speaking well about because that was one thing that I really liked about the comment section. When people hated something, they went in hard with the hate, which again, for the Resident Advisor mods, for the people that were putting on the events, probably a bad experience. But for us as fans, we got to see if someone really likes something, they're going to go hard for it and, and make you know about it. Or they'll do that thing about trying to dumb it down, trying to make it seem not a big deal so they don't want the dregs to come along. But that was the only way I could as- as- summarize, or s- summarize where I should go, right? By reading the comment section. Because someone might say, oh, don't go here because these people, they have poor, they don't invest in their sound system. They have overzealous security, blah, blah, blah. Or go here because they have great door policy. The music is really good. They don't release a lineup, but the DJs are always banging. Like you could just, you know, kind of figure out where to go. And as soon as you figured out where to go, you then kind of stuck by those parties and kept following them around. Like it was just a really good way to kind of get your education. And then of course, you always get some gems there but if they did a long if they did a massive feature on like dixon for instance right you'd get a couple of gems there about maybe i don't know some sh- some sandwich shop he might have opened i might i think i might have been in the feature but imagine just little nuggets of information you won't have known prior right who he grew up with um some baby production production friends that he grew up with that you weren't familiar with that have the similar sort of sound and you then have another dj to follow who you're so fan of then you start buying their releases it was just a real good way to discover loads of different things it kind of gave you little threads of information that you could then go and research yourself right but um again over the last six months that hasn't happened and for most part it's just turned into like a glorified events listing page for me right i, I don't really read their features apart from the um the DJ one, what's the one that I, I like? There's a one that I like on it that's that's awesome. I listen to with D, Dr. Rubenstein. Uh, ba, 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 ba. 
the one the feature I like is yeah the art of DJ. That's probably the best feature they have on there. So I, I'll read those from the top to bottom because again, being an aspiring DJ myself or a hobby DJ is good to kind of get an, an understanding of what these girls and guys at the highest level are doing, how they approach stuff, their mindset, the way they you know how serious they take the art of DJing. It's a really good feature. It's very DJ heavy, of course get into the minutia of how they prep and and put their and put their playlists together and mix it it's just really cool it's amazing one of the best ones the jeff mills one just happened i think a couple of features back was probably one of the best ones hands down we recommend you check that out but apart from that i don't really check out anything on their side i don't really read it anymore i just check it it's just an, a glorified event section for me but again this would have been far better this feature on ruben's side would have been far better if the comments option because then we'd know we'd find out some trinkets about her of the scene she grew up what kind of club match she was playing for at the beginning in the berlin scene you have somebody from the berlin scene who pipe in and say oh yeah i saw her playing at a gallery once when she first started and i can't believe how far she's gotten just a really cool way to see stuff and again I think for the artist too it's a good rep representative uh representation of who your fans are and what they sound like right i don't know it's something i don't know i found it really cool so for me personally i'm really sad that it's gone but again i'm not surprised because i've, I've got the feeling that r8 started taking itself too seriously um, which again has happened to stuff like websites like Pitchfork, Stereo Gum in the past. I don't know what it is about those sites. I think usually whenever the the four lead, the forerunner, the one at the front, the one that's kind of spearheading the movement, is kind of dictating the voice and kind of adding some kind of journalistic editorial credibility to a scene. When they're the ones leading it, they inevitably get to a position where they start to get they start to kind of think their shit don't stink. It's just a happy thing. It happens all the time. Again, it's not, to, it's not a slight an RA. It happens all the time. I mentioned before, Pitchfork, Art, Stereogum, a few other indie sites I used to check back in the day. They all went the same kind of route. They got really annoying at the end of it. They took themselves way too seriously. Um, and and they got to a point where, you know, some political favors were getting put into play. They wouldn't speak ill about certain labels or certain sponsors. There was some weird thing happening where it just didn't seem like it was a real thing that was happening. You know, it just seemed like a real situation. Like, you only have to look at the, the Nike, Peggy Goo situation to be like, you know, I don't know what was going on there. That was a bit strange. Um, some of the coverage of some of the DJs that they did is just a bit odd. So I guess they're at a point now where they're just too big. You know, they have they've got corporate sponsors. They have a lot of people kind of on their backs, probably putting pressure on them. So for us as a fans, it's it's a sad state of affairs. But I guess now we still have the techno subreddit, uh, like I mentioned previously, that's like kind of filled that void for me. So if you're out there and you're still kind of bemoaning the fact that um, the RA comments are closed, I really recommend you check this out. It's really one of my favorite uh, subreddits out there, techno subreddit on on the reddit i'll link in the show notes for you to check out but again um r.i.p the ra comment section you will be long you'll be missed man you'll be missed it was a good we had a great time i really enjoyed it i thought it was the best time of my life finding out all these new labels and finding out all these new releases and finding um track ids of things and features and other things i should look at just a really good section overall so yeah um r.i.p let's move on here we got the Bobby Hundreds book is coming out. Uh, are you guys excited? As excited as I am, I'm very excited actually. I want to check it out. We don't really get many. Um, most of the information or most of the kind of real crucial information, the ones that's really going to give the kids an understanding of where the scene has, or where the scene has come and where it's kind of gone and where it's going to in streetwear. We don't really have many books out there that really do a good job of it, right? So. I think this effort by Bobby Hundreds is really commendable. I really commend him for doing so. But again, I'm not surprised because he's somebody that's always been... I don't know. I've always got the impression he was going to lead himself to get to his prime point. He did that big documentary that... I don't know. I didn't actually watch it. Did you guys watch it? The Streetwear documentary? He did that a while back ago. And he kind of... It seemed like he's kind of going more into this. He's kind of relaxed. It seems like he's relaxed. Um, Kind of going back to the Tony Hawk interview recently that I, I listened to where, he's, where he kind of... He kind of was very self-reflective and kind of was understanding and accepting that he's never going to be cool. So he kind of occupied another position now. And I guess probably hundreds has kind of done the same thing. He's realized he's never going to be the cool guy. He's always going to be the kind of, you know, kind of corny, appealing to the kind of cheesy fan base. But that's a fan base that he still loves and appreciates, which I think is awesome. I, I think that's a cool thing about him. He hasn't uh, disowned his fans. I think a lot of cool guys, streetwear people would be annoyed if they had fans like Bobby Hundreds and they'd purposely try and pivot their brand away from those kind of kids. But Bobby Hundreds really leaned into it and kind of given them what they want for the most part. And for that, for that, he has a loyal fan base of kids who, you know, you don't have to see when they do those 
uh, sample sale kind of like grab bag things that they do in LA sometimes the queues are insane um, they still sell out of limited edition pieces that they have they still have a course family so kids are just going to keep buying their stuff and the fact that they have it in malls now it just opens up to a whole different kind of client base and consumer base of kids who probably don't have access to street stores locally I'd imagine so right I'd imagine if like even just living here in Stratford I'd imagine if they open up a little if they open up a streetwear focused store in Stratford that sold a, a wide range of brands or even kind of even if they end up selling tier c brands right let's say supreme is tier a hundreds of tier b and this is a tier c brands if they sold tier c brands in a shop somewhere in stratford westfield they would do they would do amazingly well and those kids and those brands would end up having fans for life because that was their first access to those kind of brands because you only have to look at a westfield to see the brands in there right they've got uniqlo h&m jd sports top shop in that like that you know there's no you know those guys are no competition to like a really well put together streetwear brand that has some kind of great brand image has a good legacy behind it has a good product range you know it would kill it so i understand their 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 idea of going into the malls but i know for some of us in the scene of some of the purest types it was kind of a bit of a an rip sign a bit of a death symbol that they were kind of going to go under but again i appreciate his um courage to do that i appreciate the business acumen i appreciate the fact that he did it in spite of the fact that he'd probably be looked at as a sellout by his peers and in general look what he's got him right he's got like a 20 plus year career in streetwear i think or something along those lines stupid right so he been able to live he's been able to turn his lifestyle into business um um, a la what you know the famous aaron bonder of quote and doing it on his own terms right like it's it's an amazing and the amount of people that have kind of spawned out of that the hundreds because i've always think that's a good marker same with supreme the same with rockefeller um and all the other great organization labels out there it's not necessarily about the core people it's about what happens uh, what happens to the people around it and the hundreds have spawned so many different careers of people, right? From Scott Hill to the other interns and assistants. So even that girl that was, I forgot the girl's name. That one I was always on there. People fancy, like loads of people have kind of spawned from that bloody store. The, the what you call it, Tyler, the creator, like all the, all the old future crew, the Supreme crew, there's a list of brands from half to a New York thing to, you know, to whatever else you may name it. So he's really done a good job of cultivating that community. So anyway, enough of me, uh, you know, going down on him. Uh, Bobby Hunter has a new book out called This Is Not A T-Shirt. It's a bit of a memoir based on his life, but again, centered around uh, streetwear. A quick interview here on Hypebeast that kind of goes through it. Uh, let's read a couple of the questions and answers and kind of you know, expand a little bit of it as we go along. So interview, Hypebeast, again, I'll, I'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out. So the question here is, what triggered you to write This Is Not A T-Shirt? Were there specific instances in your life that motivated you to do what you... to, to to do motivated you or did you want to write a book like this along all along since you started hundreds uh, bobby hundreds streetwear is fertile entrepreneurial grounds for a generation of youth who are um attuned to better branding social media marketing yet most of the popular business literature out there highlights a specific kind of success story embellishes but embellished by a billion dollar valuations and celebrity founders i wanted to tell an honest street story which is very true one which winnings and failure are less important than thriving and survival, which is honestly the best thing. I think that's maybe maybe the best marker of a successful streetwear brand. You don't really, I don't think anyone should get in it to become, you know, Nick Tershay and buying Blue Lambig- and Tiffany Blue Lamborghini, which is fair and cool. But I think that's his lane. That's something he's always been into. Very flashy dude, or is what it is. Or be a Ben Baller. Those guys are the way they are. They've always been like that. Trust me, I've followed the scene for a while. They've never changed, right? They've always been fucking, you know, cash. Uh, splurges and stuff and living that l- nice life which you can do but i think it should be about the idea of like you know you're in this scene you you love the product you start getting curious you start going to stores you want to deconstruct an item that you have and you want to add your own voice you want to find you want to make something that's missing on the scene and then if you are able to cultivate a community you know a, a 1000 true fans through kevin kelly right and, and kind of grow from there and somehow sustain a career forever where you don't have to work a normal job again. That is the absolute dream, right? Because most streetwear dudes have to work like a regular, regular jobs, nine to fives, work in a store, marketing agency, branding, whatever it may be. So you're always working at the behest of other people's dreams, right? You're always having to actualize someone else's passion, someone else's goals. So to do it for yourself must be, wow, what a great feeling. So just the fact that you're surviving and thriving, especially in the economy, especially in the clothing industry, right? No one needs another t-shirt. No one needs another pair of jeans. No one needs another hoodie. No one needs another sneakers. So if you just do it, that's a big deal. So yeah, prayer to him. 
sure there's the dose of streetwear history stuff and you also learn about ben and ben and i built the hundreds but this book is really about making something you're proud of connecting with other people through your purpose through your process sorry and most importantly helping them to meet each other let's tell a better business anecdote one that acknowledges the hard lessons and the communal aspects at which the glitz and glam which is very true right because a lot of the entrepreneurial stories you hear especially the ones that you hear in self-help books are mostly based around survivor bias, right? Just because that person survived and was able to kind of get through what they got through doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you will too. So in some respects, this story that he's telling in this memoir is maybe going to resonate more to kids because it doesn't necessarily mean when you start a brand, you're going to have that brand forever. I think that's something a lot of kids don't really realize. When you start a t-shirt brand or whatever it may be, or cut and sew brand, the idea is just to kind of try it out and become a creator as opposed to a consumer, right? Because we're all expert consumers. We know where to buy things. We know who made what. We know when this was launched, where it was launched, how limited it is. We all know that we have the knowledge. But to get from that place to suddenly making your own t-shirt, from realizing that maybe what's works on a psd file on your screen doesn't necessarily work on a shirt um understanding fabrication understanding application understanding finishing distribution marketing all these other aspects of a business right there's a really stuff that you only learn once you make one t-shirt once you make a jumper a long sleeve a hoodie a pair of socks and then the more you do that the more you start to realize the thing that you're actually passionate about right you start to lean into some of some things that you like and I think that's the that's the, probably the benefit of making a brand. It's similar to like probably putting a zine out. It's less about you having your magazine and more so about contributing to the scene that you felt has given you so much. You want to give something back. And in the process, you might find a little passion. You might discover that, you know what, I actually like um, the reaching out to advertisers and finding brand sponsors or marketing opportunities for, to make some money on the thing. Or I might like the photography side. I might like the writing side. I might like the art the artwork or the creative design side this that's the whole point of making a brand less so about the actual brand and more so about where that will lead you in the end and sometimes just about the story too right to tell your friends oh yeah i used to have a brand back in the day and have like 30 boxes in your house that you haven't so still still there for them to check out right it's all good um second question so much of what you preach about streetwear is centered and around community what can readers of this book learn about the importance of streetwear's role in the building a community? Yes, streetwear is about people of a product, the media and the marketplace often get it confused, attributing streetwear success disproportionately to high ticket items and long lines. Don't agree. Long lines I do agree with though because I think part of my community was based around the long lines, right? Going to buy a certain item, hanging out in the queues and actually building a community. There wasn't many resellers then. If they were, they usually got their stuff ahead of the time, be, you know, days before, maybe after the store closed, they kind of worked out some deal with the shop owners and the thing that used to happen but there wasn't really a, a lot of resellers back in when i kind of got involved in street which made the community thing a lot easier to deal with and we only had forums we didn't really have facebook groups so it was quite personable it was hard to get on blah 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 but that was the thing that i kind of resonated with a lot because by and large being into streetwear means automatically people that you're going to meet are going to be into music art graffiti uh design architecture interior design traveling uh subcultures like skateboarding and stuff like or even mma i got into that through streetwear oddly enough loads of things that you kind of get into just through are just going to be centered around that umbrella of streetwear which is kind of the amazing part of it so nowadays again i think because of the prevalence of StockX and because of because of the prevalence of supreme and other tier zero brands and whatever nike are putting out with the collaboration and years and stuff that's kind of distorted the field but there's always that's always existed but the the core tenet of street has always been about that community side of it right it's about you finding this brand that no one else knows about and dig you know and kind of making it popular or hiding the label or not letting people know where you bought it from and then eventually it gets out and everyone knows that you're the first person to kind of put them on that was what street was about that kind of one-upmanship and now it's turned into just like you know it's either dudes wearing everything that's expensive at one go or it's the fact that you're flipping everything and not wearing anything or it's just an absolute um what's the thing called cynical approach to everything that's out which i don't agree with as well right this whole oh the yesterday years were so much better no man this is probably the best era we're living in ever right you could start a brand literally on off your phone right now if you wanted to um which is amazing some some parts amazing is part scary but that idea that you could just initially get a brand now and print it without you investing any of your money into it is flipping incredible um it continues 
but it's just but it's but if it's just uh, about resale value the sophisticated customer will graduate to more profitable ventures like flipping art and real estate instead they are drawn to street because they identify with the dynamic personalities behind the brands and find each other in the process whether in the comments at a party or even one of those crazy lineups yeah those parties are so cool the launch ones i love them all the time now now they make me cringe they make me throw up my mouth because they're full of too many tryhards but back then you're all trying hard at the same time. You know, you're all young. You're all just stupid and just trying to put your best foot forward. But nowadays, you know, you've got people in their 40s still trying to be cool guy, hit streetwear dudes, which is really sad. And then you have the 18-year-olds and they're kind of battling for the same jobs. It's like someone needs to kind of give way. It either needs to be the kids going and making their own scene or it needs to be the old guys getting the fuck out. But that's never going to happen, is it? Um, in my book, I talk about how kids uh, sleep on the sidewalk for days only to buy a single T-shirt. It's not about my, it's not about it's not about the clothing. It's about connecting, and that's very true, right? Because I bought I tell a story all the time. I bought a baby gate seller tape after queuing up for maybe a day and a half, right? And everyone in the queue rinsing the complete shop that I wanted, right? Because Baby Ape, back in the day, the the nowhere store, they used to only have a particular amount of items they used to come in through the drop. Only a num only a certain quantity would come in, like a particular Averex jacket, a particular kind of leather jacket, or a down jacket, or a long sleeve, or a hoodie. And by the time the the main the main people in the front of the queue got it got there, most of it was gone because they already had an inside info from the store manager about how many pieces were coming in line. So they might pull in their friends to get some other stuff to resell. So by the time we got in there, there was nothing left. We had to buy sellotape, and I bought sellotape. That's how much I was connected to Baby Ape. I love the brand so much that I actually bought sellotape for twenty pounds or twenty five quid or something. It was insane. Um, but yeah, this whole interview is available now on Hypebeast. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but definitely check it out. I'm definitely going to read the book. When I get the book, I'm going to do a review of it, actually. Um, I'm a big fan of Bobby Hundreds. I think he's always got some interesting things to say. So it'd be cool to see how he's been able to kind of summarize his experience in the streetwear industry. But again, I'll put the link in the show notes for you guys to check out. But the title of the article is Bobby Hundreds book is This Is Not Streetwear. This Is Not a T-Shirt, sorry. It's a really, it's a, really a guide to cultivating communities. It's on Hypebeast now, but I'll link it in the show if you can check out. And his book is available now. This is not a t-shirt. I think it's coming out June 22nd or something like that, right? When's it coming out here? Let's scroll down and check here. His book is going to be out on June 25th. I'm sure there's going to be some activations for it too, right? I'm pretty sure. Anyone in the comments, let me know if there's activations for it. You're probably going to do some speaking tours. Hopefully he comes to London, does something here too, even though there's nothing to come down here for. You know, there's only sneaker sites, sneaker stores, like sneakers and stuff and stuff around or end clothing. It's not really a dedicated streetwear store or scene here anymore. It feels like most of the kids in London are really into fashion as opposed to streetwear. But again, it would be cool to see what he does if he does not come into London. But I recommend you check it out. Out June 25th. This is not a t-shirt by Bobby Hundreds. It should be a cool one. I wonder if this is a play on words on the other book that Bobby, on Aaron, Aaron Bodger put out last time, that t-shirt book that I have. I wonder, maybe it is. But anyway, um, let's move on. Ba, 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 ba. We have here yeah, CDG and Nike RTL. Oh, I love these so much. I'm not sure about you, right? I love these. I love these. Love, love, love these. I saw these on the runway when they first debuted, and I was like, fuck, what the fuck are these? They remind me a little bit of the Dolce Gabbana trainers that I think Lil Uzi Vert and a few other people, a few of those kind of like, you know, Sankar's rappers wear that really gaudy looking and have all the kind of bangles all over it. But I just love these because I'm a sucker for black shoes. I think these that this version of a shock is something that I'd actually wear. I, mem I mentioned a few times that I'm not really a big fan of shocks, but I love the the shock the shock store that goes all the way around. The thing that, the thing about a shock that I don't like is the same thing I don't like about the Vapor Max. The Vapor Max when you look down when you look when you look down on it when you look uh, down on your foot wearing a Vapor Max. You can't see the bubble. It doesn't protrude out. I'd like it to protrude out a bit more. It kind of tucks in. So it kind of looks like you're not wearing anything. It kind of looks a bit weird. And because I'm so used to wearing chunky shoes with soles that kind of protrude outwards, I kind of like that. So these shocks do a good way of kind of displaying that because the shock goes around all around the side. If you can see from this picture here, I'll, I'll link in the show notes anyway if you can check out. But it's basically a black shock and the shock bits go all the way through the mid. So instead of ending up just on the heel, you have this little, look how that kind of protrudes out there. You see, it kind of like pops out there a little bit more on that side there. That's what I love to see. So they look amazing. They've got these gold chains around them, all black, Comme de Garçon logo on the tongue. The black pairs are obviously my fave. It's sort of like a lace, I think, um, applique on the upper, I'm sure. Maybe similar to the trousers. They look amazing. I'm not sure if they're just going to be women's only, but I don't care. I'm going to try and get them. They're out soon, I think, the end of the week, aren't they? May 20th, no? When are they going to be out? Oh, there's an update here, actually. June 14th, so the end of the week, they're going to be out. But again, I'm a big fan of them. Uh, Nike, Comme des Garçons, Nike Shock TL. So, so, so good. 
I'll keep the chain. I think someone in the comments said take the chain off. But I think, again, I don't know if they're going to look like this on me, though. Because I've got a boat of a foot. I'm a size 10 UK. So I'm sure if they're going to look as good on me like this. But I hope so. They do. But they just look, I don't know why they look so good. The white and the black pair, they look fucking banging. I'd wear these instantly. Like, so good. They might be women's only, though. Hopefully not. But wow, 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 wow. I'm all over them. So, so, so all over them. Here's a picture of them from 10 Coral Summer uh in Seoul but again big fan of these shoes they look fucking amazing but again I'm a sucker for these just black big black shoes from my triple s's to my Dr. Martins Jaden boots to my Air Force Ones to the Yeezy 700s which are not big not not the biggest shoe in the world but it's still quite wide looking wise I don't know what it is about these shoes that really kind of get me going but I love them, love them all, love them all, man. But yeah, check them out. They're gonna be out on June fourteenth on in all your regular places. No, I think Dover Street are gonna have a raffle for them actually at the moment, so you can register to enter the raffle at Dover Street Market if you go check out the site as well. If you're interested in those, again, probably not much resale value for you resellers out there. But again, if you actually if you're about wearing your shoes, to forget rent reselling. These are probably the ones you're gonna to wanna to wear, like these and some like you know, um, what should you call it? Some pants from maybe joint junior maybe you could get a pair of them i've got a pair of junior pants i could wear that probably look quite cool with these <sighs> they just look so hard man i'm so all over them amazing shoes all over them like salt and chips mate anyway let's move on here what else is next on the list here we have this week's summer sorry this week's sneaker drops from Hypebeast as well, a little collection of shoes that are dropping this week, most of which I'm going to pass on and have no interest in purchasing apps whatsoever. Has anyone got a bit of fatigue with trainers? I'm, I, am I the only one that's kind of trainer fatigued, sneaker fatigued? I know I am. I I've, haven't bought, I don't really buy trainers when they're meant to, when they come out. I usually just buy them after the fact on the stock or something. I don't really want to get involved in the waking up and checking my flipping Nike app and all that sort of stuff and going online, registering for a raffle on end or or any other nonsense place that does it, or retweeting and leaving a comment. I hate all that shit. But in general, I'm just really tired of drops. I don't care. If the stuff that I want is out and I like it and I'm browsing and I'm... Because mostly I always browse scents and good hood and places for clothes and stuff. And then I happen to stumble across shoes. And most of it is just like basics, like a pair of Vans Old Schools, a pair of uh, nice um, Nike Ep um, Epics, a pair of nice Air Maxes, a pair of nice Adidases. Um, just some classic shoes i'll just stumble upon but oh yeah that'd be quite cool actually some nice new balances that i might find on tresbian or something but i rarely if ever i'm seeking out trainers it's always i always find them as a byproduct of me checking out some clothes i want to purchase i'm not sure if people else have the same uh thing as me but if you do leave a comment and let me know but i'm, I'm, I'm a bit trainer fatigued man i'm not i'm kind of over shoes in general i don't really get excited about many things apart from you know fucking fancy comedy gone so uh, nike shock tl which is right here again again i love these look at the shape of them but again may, may, maybe it's just me i don't know um gray uh they've got so that and then they've got a nike air max plus uh color flip black a nike tn again not for me they're probably gonna be big with the kids on instagram they look like a very instagram friendly shoe looks like for the most part it's a grey upper and all the kind of accents are neon green with a little neon green swoosh. And the other shoe is kind of flipped the other way around with the purple accents and stuff. Again, not for me. I'm not really that bothered about TNs. Don't really care. Um, then they've got the Nike Shock R4. This, this is the shock that I hate. The Nike Shock R4 uh, Black Glow. They looked horrendous. I just hate how it looks like on the front. Not really a fan of them. Coming out June 11th. Um, then there's an interesting one, right? The Supreme Air Jordan 14. Again, not something I'd, I'd probably wear, but I quite like them. I don't know why. Again, I'm, I'm really, a, I really commend Supreme for not choosing the easy option when it comes to their sneaker collabs. They could make so much money. They could make, they could have so much brand exposure. We don't need it, right? It's fucking Supreme. It's not some unknown brand. But they could do, they could easily hit out of the park if they did some like, you know, staple models. Air Max 90, Air Max 1 um jordan's jordan one two three to four uh not two probably take out yeah one three and four they could do um air forces which they've done of course high mid low they could do mx 87s which they've done already 97s which i think they've done already the 97s i think they have right or was that undefeated no it's undefeated right? i'm not sure if they've done 97s they could do a plethora of shoes right but they tend to always pick the hardest ones to sell or the ones that aren't the most hype right whether it's a whether it's a match court or court whatever it's called a blazer 
whether it's a Jordan 14, who, who, who have you heard speaking about Jordan 14s in your life recently? Or, you know, be, like bemoaning the fact that they can't get a Jordan 14. It's flipping, it's really commendable that they do it. To take such a big risk at a point, because again, like they said, it just makes so much easy money just flipping Jordan 1 colorways again and again and again. But again, I'm, I'm a big fan of these Jordan 14s. I think they look really cool. I think the, the little dots are kind of little metal ball bearings, right? Um, with the white, white with the black, and then they got blue with black as well I, I like both colorways i'd wear them actually um probably won't suit anything that i wear day to day but i quite like the look at them they probably might look better on smaller feet they probably look better with some shorts on but i i like the shoe man i think it looks pretty cool and those are coming out this thursday as well so to keep an eye out for that one june 13th um then we have a nike air max 90 python pack Again, Nike and their retros of Air Max 90s. My God, so terrible. And it's odd because there's so many vintage, there's so many Nike vintage catalogs or things that you might find from Boone to um, Asanya Mag that I have and other Japanese-based magazines which have a whole plethora of colorways of shoes that you could put, that you could kind of flip into Air Max 90s. Whether it's Air Max 90s originals or other Air Maxes, that would look so much better than all the stuff they put out. It's so un it's so unusual that they do this. And, and the odd thing is that you'd think, okay, cool. Release your weird, crazy colours with, you know, in this kind of pack. And then in, in your core stores like Foot Looker and JD Sports and whatever it may be, have the quintessential retro bog standard colourways. They don't do that either. They still have the shitty colourways of JD Sports too. So they don't kill on either side. The only way they're gonna kill it is if they have a collaboration. And it just happens they have a collaboration, they have a collaboration, they collaborate with somebody. They do a particular shoe color, which everyone loves. And then six months later, they distill it into a GR and then they kind of flip it and make it kind of commoditized. And now that shoe's not special anymore. It's such an annoying process they go through. It really, really frustrates me. There's so much rich colorway history in their own archive they could relate back to that would look much better than this shit. That's just terrible. Like, what is that? Just terrible. Black upper with a green sort of like snake skin silhouette with what is that on the on the side there is that new bug or something like it's just the white pair is quite nice i think right they just, just just put out the white pair the white pair is probably better just take away that black one we don't need it or just flip it a bit more make it a bit more i don't know interesting just we don't need that black pair it's just a waste of time <sighs> but what do i know then we've got an ADS originals temper run pride is this for pride month again pride the commodities the commoditization of pride has been very interesting in the last few years right we've got pride month now um, we've got brand, all brands under the sun incorporating the LGBTQ uh, flags and moniker into their shoes when most of these companies haven't really been, you know, advocates of the LGBTQ community. I'm, I'm interested to know what those kind of, what those people in those scenes actually think of these items in general. Like, if I was gay, I wouldn't be called, be, I would be called dead wearing any of these shoes, right? It just doesn't make any sense. I don't know. It's like gay pride. Once you've been to your, once you've been to one, are you gonna to go to another one? Like it's just like I don't know. If you're gay, you just live your life and you just carry on. You want you want to be accepted. You want it to be normal. The last thing you want to do is have this special. I don't know. Maybe I'm just speaking from a point of a straight male that I don't really understand. But I don't know. I wouldn't be cool. Be, I, I, I I would probably go to pride, but I wouldn't be wearing pride apparel. The most I'd have on is a flag, right, in a hat form or something. But I wouldn't have some shoes day to day so everyone knows oh guess what i'm gay people would know that sh people would know my mannerisms or they would know if i tell them it's not their business really isn't it what i do in the bedroom i just don't understand it's a very strange peculiar thing and again what happens when these things don't sell and they all end up in the sales rack because what what percentage of the world is actually um lgbtq anyway it's a weird thing especially if they're going to put it out as a gr if it's out as tier zero cool enough as a limited edition fair but if it's out on in all their different stores because they want everyone to know that they're supporting everyone right and flooding the market and then it all ends up in the sales rack all ends up in kind of outlet stores that doesn't look good either does it like all the lgbtq stuff is on the, is on the sale rack marked down to like you know 50 percent. but again what do i know next shoot interesting we've got the jordan for fly flying it red and blue again i don't know who needed this or why they did it but I'm interested in the concept. It might be a good way to do a retro, actually incorporating some new technologies, making the shoe a bit lighter. The sole looks the same. The upper is different. Again, I'm not sure what relevance that has to do with anything. It's a lifestyle shoe and the performance. I get it. But again, the colorways, why? Why not just do a fly knit in the original bread and uh, what do you call it? Um, University blue and the cements and stuff, right? And the tribute, whatever. Like, I don't know. I just don't get why you would do a fly knit of a Jordan 4 
in these weird colorways like in, in october like red october is of course easy colorways and i just don't understand it's going to end up in the sale rack no one's going to buy this at full price they're 220 dollars like insane available in june 14th but again i just don't get why you'd want to buy these at full price right now when you can just wait when they get on sale they should have put them in out in the og colorways first but again you know these people Again, a Nike be true G LGBTQ shoe. Like this is horrible an MX90 with four stripes on it. Done the red ray. Probably cut trying to copy John Geiger. Again, done shit. Just a horrible cut colorway. I don't see what the need of this is. Be true to collection. Who cares about that? No one. The jo the Pat Air Jordan Pata 7 are quite nice. Again, not something I'd probably wear, but I think for the kids, they'll probably like the colorway. It's quite versatile. So it reminds me a little bit of the Travis Scott Jordan one. Um, I'm not really a fan of the, the logo on the midsole. I think that's a bit overdone. They're probably going to put that somewhere else or maybe maybe a bit tonal to kind of tone it down somewhat. But again, these guys are much more on the board than I am and they know what they, their kind of demographic wants. They don't want a Jordan that just looks like a different colorway. They want it to say what the collaboration is. So that's a good way to do it. So again, a good shoe that way, June 15th, and they're only $200. Again, what would you pick, right? This garbage Jordan flying it, right, in red and blue, or would you pick a Patera Jordan 7, right? That's going to come out in June 15th. And this in, in, this, this might be the first Jordan that they've collaborated on in Pata. Is it maybe the first Jordan? Which is strange because they're big basketball. No, it's not. That's, um, that's Pigau, isn't it? They're big on basketball. Um, These Dutch guys, I don't really think they've played much. I don't see a dude playing play football. So it's a weird collaboration regardless. But anyway, it doesn't matter. And they've got Neymar in the, in the lookbook as well, which is a bit weird. But maybe he might wear it day to day. He might, might be a friend of brand. But regardless, what would you rather wear? This Pat Jordan 7 or this garbage? And it's $20 more. Just like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, then we've got the Yeezy Boost 700 V2. Tempura again. I love it. It's a flip on the colorway that just came out recently. The V2s are probably my... I don't know. I probably prefer the, the V1s. The OGs. The, the Wave Runners, essentially. 700s. But I quite like this shape as well. I want to get um, the all black pairs coming out soon as well. These are coming out on June 15th. They're well made, well constructed. Um, they're super comfortable the centers in general they're very versatile they work with most shoes and again they're just a nondescript shoe they can flip them with most things i'm not not really a fan of the other yeezy personally mostly because they don't really fit my foot i've got a bit of a wide foot so this yeezy 700 is a great thing for me in general and especially now since they've got elasticated they've got elastic on the tongue so you don't need to tie them too tightly and they stick on your foot better and they the sizing is worked out a bit more better than the other shoes i had than the first ones in gray so again, these are out June 15th, um, Easy Boost 700 Tefra. So it's like a grayish sort of colorway there. We have these Jordan 8s Quai 50s. I'm not even going to bother reading these fucking garbage. Bin them right now. Rating Champ Essex, Kyoto Edition. Um, again, not for me. Probably more so for the streetwear dads out there. Rating Champ is, again, um, you know, a well-known purveyor of sweats and stuff and quality apparel in that regard so maybe people might like that for that resistance but again i don't know who cares about asics probably the bottom of all bottom collaborations and i think nowadays because kids are so obsessed with resale value and things that are hyped they're just not going to get this like back in the day when we always buy sneakers it was about buying the shoe that no one wanted right deodora asics like you know like looking for shit trying to make high-tech calls about finding gems now these kids just want the same old jordan one nike air max 90 air max one ada stan smith ada shelter it was the same sort of models converse one stars it doesn't really go deviate from those things so it's going to be hard for them to kind of connect with millennials or kids on this it's going to be older customers such as myself but i'm not really a fan of them either then you've got the nike air max tailwind spirit uh, spirit tail which is nice colorway again maybe a nod to some of their archive colorways just a great shoe, worked really well, good colorways, representative of what's going on in retro, but also bringing it back fresh into what's happening now. What aced it, done well, I'm not sure why they didn't do that on Air Max 90s, but again, maybe because it's a new model and they've got some fresh ideas, but again, big fan of that one, coming out G15, $160 again. What do you ever buy, that or that Jordan 4 up there? Like, fucking hell. Then you've got this, Essex Gel Canyo, um, quite nice actually, I, I wear these to run in, these look quite interesting, Gel Soul, Big branding on the side. They look very interesting. Yeah, I quite like this show. Oh, I'd actually wear these. June 15th, I've been at 149. Yeah, um, so quite a few shoes out there that you could check out. This is from the um, this week's drops from Hypebeast. They do a quite a good feature of kind of rounding up some of the drops you should be checking out for. I'll link again in the show notes for you guys to check out uh, this week's drops in sneakers, in streetwear, and everything in between.
Okay, that's an hour of the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you for your attention this sunny, sunny Tuesday. Um, as always, if you want for more information regarding myself, check out my website, agsnozinger.com, which is available in the show notes there in the description. If you're, re- if you're listening via the uh, podcast app, check it out in your show notes. If you're listening via YouTube, if you find the description there, um, give me a like and subscribe if you're watching via YouTube on the audio podcast app. Five-star review will go a long way and help people to find the podcast. And I will see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. Before then, goodbye, take care, and see you guys soon. Peace!